Hello! Welcome to the Church of Cecil. That's right, Boston Parish. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Are you out there in the real world? The, the aggressive advertisements, or is it my aggressive personality? Hi there. Welcome to the Church of Cecil and the Comics Talk with Reverend Sully. I am uh, I am Cecil's little cousin Lentil from uh, from Boston, from South Boston. Uh, so I'm filling in for Reverend Sully today. And uh, representing my my big cousin Cecil from New York, uh, he published his his big book Cash Grab. It's going to unite the world in peace, love, and harmony. This is true. Uh, you know, I hope that you're uh, having a great day. We're going to read about some funny books. You know these these things out there that you you grown people pay money for, and that you think are going to like you know be like, hey, this is my retirement, and you're like, ah, you're going to be shit out of luck there. You'll be wrapping those things in your fucking socks there in the middle of winter time or burning them for heat, you know? <laughs> Who are you kidding there, pal? Hi! <laughs> Welcome to this show. It's the Comics Talk with uh, with Cecil's little cousin from Boston. My name's Lentil. I was hoping you would join. I was hoping to drop in one day, and I am here. I'm cosplaying with myself. I am. I am dressed up as my my big cousin, my, my, my cousin Cecil there from New York. I would go visit him when I was a kid, and he would take me out swimming. And uh, I would, he would he would just leave me out there. And it, it took the the Coast Guard like four days to find me. I was hungry, and I was just I was out there though. And um, but he's a good guy though. I've forgiven him. You know, we're family and all. Hello there, everyone out there in the chat. How you doing today? Wicked pisser. Hi, welcome. Who we got? We got a Lithador? How you doing? Hi, everybody. We got LT. Hi there, Lord Doth. How you doing up there? He's I think he's in Canada. Where the air is thinner because they're up there higher, you know? Uh <laughs> let's see how long I can keep the kayfabe going before I, I shit myself crazy. Ha <laughs> ha! Welcome to the show. It's um it's uh, it's the new comic book review day here from our Boston studios, which is down the street from the corner. We are we are live and direct to you out there in TV land. That's right there. That's right. Uh, don't be don't be shocked. It's uh, oh, it's James. How you doing, James? James owes me twenty dollars. You better like pay up, or I'm gonna have to send Pikachu over. Uh, you know, to, like you know, to break your legs or something. Well, not your legs. You need them to work. I know. Just a couple of fingers though. You know what I mean? You degenerate gambler, you. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Who is this guy? I'm Lentil. I'm Cecil's little cousin. I'm filling in forever in Sully today, doing the comic book show. Let's see how long it takes for him to figure out all the bonds and then the ropes and the knots. And if he if he gets out of the closet, you know, and that's not even a gay joke either. I think he's straight. I, I'm not sure, though. He hasn't had a date in, like, forever. <laughs> How are you guys doing out there? I hope you're feeling wicked pissa and getting better by the minute and uh, have a couple of beers, kick back and relax. You're watching the Sox game. The Bruins are on tomorrow night. The Celtics are playing tonight. You know, the Patriots can take the rest of the friggin' year off. You know, they need it. You know, we don't talk about sports radio here, though, because that shit is toxic. That's right. We don't need any more toxic culture people out there in our fandom splitting us apart there. It is not Cecil's fault. The Jack Show broke up. He is not. He, well, he could. He does have that Yoko Ono energy. That's true. I remember once, you know, when we were kids, you know, he would come over to play and we would play hide and seek. And then, like, you know, he'd tell me to go hide. And then, like, you know, nighttime would come around and I would get, get hungry and, and I would, um, and, you know, find my way home. And, and he'd just be laughing like he fought it in an elevator. You know, but he's a good guy. You know, I mean, I, I've forgiven him. It's been a lot of years. So uh, how are you guys doing out there today? It's good to see you. And um, so crack open a beer, you know, sit your down your rear. And uh, let's uh, talk about funny books there. How you doing? <laughs> Hold on one second there. I think I hear someone at the door. Okay, I was able to keep character for five whole minutes before I got bored. <laughs> How are you guys doing out there? 
Good to see you. It is time for the comic talk with Reverend Sully here at your dojo for tactical and practical spirituality. Um, it is the Church of Cecil Day. Um, see, I got my Cecil Says T-shirt. Came with some stickers. Came with my cash grab mug. Actually, a pint glass that had an Irene Strakowski variant cover art on it. Really cool stuff. But I packed that up and put that away. You know, when you're, you know, sometimes you only need one glass, and I have a two glasses. So I'm gonna save that one for later. And where um I hope uh there'll there will be ads. <clears throat> so let me know in the chat when like if we're hitting an advertisement. Uh, cause I, I won't be able to see it. I'm, I'm I'm in front of the camera. You know, I'm not seeing the show really, but uh apparently there will be ads because we are monetized. We yet we made monetization last Monday. Uh, I'm not worried about super chats yet or memberships or super stickers. Um, you know, I turned the ads on. Sure, I, I've made 90 cents so far. Woo! Let that accumulate and <laughs> just here it comes. That YouTube dash. Woo! Well, thank you very much. It's time for the comic book review show, and we talk about things geeky. It's your geeky chill stream. And, um, yeah, I'm thinking of, I could go as Cecil for, uh, for one of the conventions. I'm thinking about that. It could be a, that could be a decent cosplay. I mean, it's going to get hot underneath that hat, like wearing that in the summertime, but the sacrifices we make to do a cosplay, you know, I, I think I could pull it off. Be like, Oh geez, Cecil. Wow. And have like these women run up to me, like demanding, like, um, you know, back payments for their, you know, child support. <laughs> <clears throat> oh boy. Yeah. That lentil thing. That was, that was a stream of consciousness. <laughs> I just, this is like the dog got off the leash. Don't worry. Be back. Give him a minute. Get all this energy. He was in a, was in a crate for his four, first four months. He, he needs to stretch his legs. <laughs> Where did he come up with these stuff? I don't know. Straight out, Pika. You're on TV. Yeah. Well, he's a, he's used to being on TV. So there's an, so aren't all of the, you know, the um all of there we go. See? Oh, that's gone. It's, it's, it's kind of busy. I never I haven't used an ad uh a um a um a scrolling Chiron yet? Scrolling Chiron? Is that some kind of Robotech joke? No, 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 no. That's what they call that thingy on the bottom of a news feed that keeps you up to date with breaking news. When news breaks, we fix it. That's right, huh? That was the Daily Show, wasn't it? Back, way back in the John Stewart days. How are we doing? We review comic books on Sundays. We read a shitload of comic books. I got an Image Comics Pirate Chest. I read one, two, three, four, five, six Image Comics out of that. I had a Dark Horse. I've read, I think I may have read them all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Dark Horse comics. Let's see. How many, how many Marvel comics? One, two, three, four, five. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 Marvel comics, and 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 different DC comics. And in addition to it all, we have our bag of funny books. That's right. We go to our local comic book shop once a week on Wednesday, New Comic Book Day, where I get my new comic books. And what is... Oh, wait a second. What is that? Is that a Tonkabon manga? Yes, it is a Tonkabon manga, a manga Tonkabon. And um, <laughs> am I going to someday? I will. And I'll know when the time is ripe. As the out of print sci fi author Kilgore Trout said, uh, you know, the time needs to be ripe, R I P E, ripe <clears throat> for the plucking. Salancha. 
Ah, very good, very good. I think I'm going to ask Jesse Blaze Snyder to come on the show and talk about King of Kings, his uh, and whatever else he wants to talk about. You know, hopefully for half an hour. Let me see if he if he wants when that will happen. Don't know. Like I said, I've never had um, a guest on the show. Not yet. I've never interviewed anyone, really. But um, but I one thing I do, and I also read two Xenoscope comics as well. Yeah. And um, exactly. What are Xenoscope comics? They throw that's just another print. And uh, But let's get to it. Let's uh, talk about some comic books. Oh, thank you, Derek Lee Frederick. How you doing there? Thank you. <clears throat> We've got uh, yeah, some image books that came up this week that I read. Let's see. There's um, for $4.99, and it's called uh, 7174 AD by T.P. Louise and Ashley Wood. Um of racing robots, talks on tall buildings, a collection of heels, cocktail dresses, and um, it's very like sketchbook like. It's 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 a little all over the place. It's indie. This is indie as anything. Did, did let's see. Alithador asks, did I read any pirated comics that were good enough to make you want to buy them when you go back to the LCS? Yes, this week we'll find out when we look through our stack of funny books. Seriously, yeah, there, there, was, there were at least one or two. We'll, we'll see <clears throat> when we open up the bag at the end of the... Yeah, but it's... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to have like been able to read that. You know, there was... Uh, Let's see. Destiny's Gate, which I kind of blew through a bit. Uh, Kill Your Darlings, number eight of eight. Um, written by Ethan Parker and Gri Griff Griffin Sheridan. Art by Robert Quinn. Uh, John J. Hill does the lettering. And uh, it's like I, I made the... I read issue one way back. I... Um, made the comparison to Joe the Barbarian by Grant Morrison and Sean Gordon Murphy on DC Vertigo. It's like, that's like, you know, mixing like your toy box with a childhood imaginary story, which may or may not be imaginary. That's the whole thing. And so, um, but all the kids in this have grown up and seems it seems though that they're their uh their cartoon like army and backup people just follow them into adulthood or something like that. We had a moon man number two. Let's put a pin in that. Something epic number nine. By Simon uh, Kudransky from the One Man Art Comic Studio. He also did uh, like a Blood Covenant, which is a werewolf. It's a werewolf book. Lord Thought says he only picked up two comics this week. I don't remember ever had. I don't remember ever only having two in my pull list ever. Well, it's a first time for everything, isn't there? <laughs> But really, um, <clears throat> what were they? Were you, did you like them? Was it all right? I got I had a couple of things in my in my poll this week, but something epic. It, it kind of reads like an old issue of Hellblazer. That's that's what I'm getting out of it. But it's all one person doing the art, inking story and then hand, getting it lettered that's fine you know geez <clears throat> there was spawn issue 352 that was pretty decent you know i like 351 a lot and i bought that so though though 
Alithador, there's one for you. Last month, I bought Spawn 351 after reading my pirate copy uh, because I was that impressed with it. And I liked it that much. I gave it a chance. I hadn't seen a Spawn comic in year. I got in years. I got, got to buy a $2.99 funny book and just feel it out. You know, to, you know, look at the ads, you know, test its weight. You know, it's just a it's just a normal printed comic book, but for two ninety nine. Ah, follow the House of X four and Star Trek nineteen. I hope Lord Lord Thoth, uh, you are you liking Star Trek? Is it set in the Kelvin universe, or is it trying to think it's giving us the original universe? There's so many things and. You know, that's under Heather Antos' stewardship. Is she doing a good job? And ch check this out, too. I just, I've been using a piece of legal pad as a mouse pad for, you know, a ripped off cardboard back of, of, of my legal pad. I've been using it for years as a, as a mouse pad. And I, so I finally just broke down and bought a mouse pad. This is the science officer. This is, I'm a Spock when it comes to being Star Trek. I'm a Spock. I really am. And um, it's right over here. I used to wear this daily. But it kept on falling off. This is the Vulcan IDIC symbol. I-D-I-C. In infinite diversity are infinite combinations. Go ahead. Maybe I should get my head out of the way. Your big fat head, Eric. There you go. Well, that's that's the addict symbol. I still have that. I mean, I put it on. It's on my meditation altar. <coughs> Let's see. And the Weatherman, Volume Three, Issue Four, which was decent. It's just some sci-fi. You know, just I I just jumped into it. This is on its third volume. It's all right, you know. It's kind of black pilly, you know. Alithador says, um, original generation Star Trek. I always preferred Bones, but even as a kid, I was a bit of a grouch. LOL. <laughs> Damn it, Jim. I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Assassins! Murderers! <laughs> yep. That's uh, that's from City on the Edge of Forever. <laughs> and he jumps into the the Guardian of Forever and changes space time and history. We have Dark Horse Comics. What did we what did we see for Dark Horse Comics this week? We've had issue five of Assassin's Apprentice 2 um by Robin Hod Hob Jody Hauser. Ryan Kelly, Jordan Belair, and Hassan Atsmani Allahu, who is on. I'll show this. I, I, I sometimes I don't know about showing, you know. I'm a little leery at that, but hey, fuck it. Let's see. Here we go. This is this is a cover to a Dark Horse comic. All right. And these here is. Your on cover credits Robin Hod, Pob, and Jody Hauser, the writers, Ryan Kelly, the line artist, Jordy Belair, the colorist, Hassan Asmani Allahu, the letterer. The letterer. And here you go, right there. There it's written out for you. <laughs> and um, remember, it's just line art, and then line art just gets kicked over to the colorist now. There is like it's kind of like they're either an anchor is old school. And it just it looks so flat. I mean, I just I know that they're trying. This is some decent line work here, you know, and and and, and hatchings and and but then you have all these just just it's just yeah, I'm it's not my thing. Not my thing. But I'm not gonna bag on it either. It's just like you know, but it is the future of our hobby. We got Blue Book 19, uh, 1947, issue number three by James Tinian IV. 
and um, Michael Avon Emming. And this is on the Tiny Onion imprint through Dark Horse Comics. And um, Tinian is, uh, he made a name for himself at DC Comics. And he's, uh, I like, the Project Blue Book was an Air Force thing, classified UFO stuff, Area 51 stuff, like from way back in the 20th century. Um, and so this is like, you know, just, it's interesting because it has that classic Michael Avon Emming kind of style to it. And it um, and it only uses one color, blue. Not even like in the black, white, and red. It it it, it um. It's it's just used as shading and lighting, light source, except for the whites, of course. But you know this is. I kind of like that. That just a very, very overly sparse color palette, one could say. And I hope you're all having a great day out there. Hope you all had a good week. Let's see. Coming at you from Scott Snyder and Jamal Eagle is uh, for it's sixty pages for four ninety nine. It's Dudley Datsun and the Forever Machine. Um. Tom Napoleon, Tom Napolitano doesn't get his name on the cover. Why not? I think it's to do with like, just, you know, things, modernity reasons. I'm not sure. I just... <laughs> but this is an issue one by Scott Snyder. Who you might remember from Batman and Justice League. You know, he's and Jamal Eagle lays down some really good line work it's got some inks so it goes yeah it's got pencils by Jamal Eagle inks by Juan Castro but then it goes to a you know through a digital process that kind of just but that's comics yeah you know Cut and paste on a monopeia. It's like you know, kid genius and hijinks ensue. And it's like he's got Dash and a bit of Harry Potter, like an urban Harry Potter. That's how I would say it. We have Helen of Windhorn, issue number two, uh, written by Tom King and with art by Bilkis El Ed Ed Evely. And um, it's a period piece of um, that jumps through time, like about like the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, perhaps, and then to like like almost now. And but it's got some seriously good line work. It's a really good art, and um, but it's just like you know. My first, I like I'm walking right into this story. Ah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I really dug Helen of Windhorn one and still have to read two. So this is, you know, Tom King getting to play, apply his trade outside of, you know, using DC superheroes. He's, this is his own stuff. It's decent. You know, it's really good. I mean, It's not very, you know, I, 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 I didn't go out and buy it. Let's put it that way. What else do we have here from Dark Horse Comics? We have John Carpenter's Toxic Commando, number two. And um, it's just, in, yeah, it's one of those examples of digital comics for me. Just, yeah, let, let's show that. Why not? Like, Look at the backgrounds of these panels. There's no these are this is one page. We've got four sequential panels. And look at the background. There's no back, you know. Oh, 
I don't know, just this, this digital stuff. Look, oh, look, it's, it's the same word, just cut and paste and dropped all over, the, you know, the, 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 the panel. Hey, hey, what's up? Thank you, Nerd Boreal. Good to see you. Thank you. Hit the like. Yeah, hit that like button, folks. Smash that like button. But hey, Bungie, good to see you. Yeah, I'm not a fan of those backgrounds either. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, that's the same letter over and over. That's the same graphic over and over again. Do you see what I see? Yeah. Let's throw in uh, some Bende dot screen tone filter in the background too for some shading, you know, and, uh, but that is like, that's basically, yeah, that's all the same. That's just cut and paste and dragged and dropped. We have um, Star Wars, the High Republic Adventures issue number one here on Dark Horse Comics too. Dark Horse usually has one or two. Star Wars comics. Now, Marvel Comics has the rest uh, because, you know, Disney owns Marvel Comics. Dark Horse had the Star Wars license since from like, what, 1991 with, with Dark Empire 1 and also this beginning of what we know as Lucas Books, this entangled continuity where everything matters. And they did they had such precision and such a good job until 2020 until 2012. Where Disney bought it, threw all the old canon away, and has made a mess. You know, Lucas, now it's called Lucasfilm Story Group, and they made a mess. And even just a few years in, they just tripped over each other and made such a mess of continuity and canon. And so, being a Star Wars fan now is kind of difficult. Now, the, the, my only problem with this is because this is written by Kevin Scott, you know. And look, it's got the it's got the Disney logo on the trade dress as, as well. This is the cover, you know. It's a four ninety nine comic, I think. This is thirty pages. Um, it's written by Kevin Scott, who is writing Marvel Star Wars books. Okay, this is you know here is the official Marvel have the same page. You know, this is this is the official Disney the disc canon post twenty twelve timeline. Okay, novelizations of the movies are not EU or Legends; they are canon, always have been. Uh, but here it is, you know. And then comes your scroll type opening of an info dump page. That's part and parcel with Star Wars. But here it is. It is a time of great turmoil. A year has passed since the destruction of the Starlight Beacon Station by the nefarious Marchion Rowe and his Nihil Marauders. The, Ni the Nihil or the Nile have established an, an occlusion zone in the Outer Rim, stranding hundreds of worlds behind their storm wall. Communications are blocked and ships that are that enter are lost to the void or destroyed by the Nihil. The Republic is helpless against this sinister threat, and the brave and wise Jedi Knights remain fearful of Rose fabled nameless creatures, which the Jedi have learned are very real and very deadly. And um, yeah, look, more digital art, like all this, you know. But We have, okay, I guess my big problem with this would be just, it's kind of simple. The, 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 high, the High Republic is a span of probably a few generations. You know, it's not just one generation of stories. It's just a lot of time and a lot of space to cover. Why do you have to be something that's synoptic to... The, what Marvel's laying down exactly with their volume three, phase three of High Republic. If you watch the show, you know that I've been reading them and I've been kind of liking them too. They've dropped the message, the messaging, you know, uh, you know, 
that the lead girl with the side head shaved has grown up from it being a Padawan. And, you know, she doesn't have that hairdo anymore. She grew out of it. And you don't see Geode, the flying rock. You don't have, it actually feels very Star Wars. Kudos to you, please. There, uh, the Shadows of Starlight miniseries was really good too. By the end of it, you have a really Star Wars level big bad. Again, good job. So Star Wars High Republic Phase 3 on Marvel is pretty decent. But why does Dark Horse have to do something so kind of like tight? It's not even, it's not like it's crossing over, but it's you have, you have the same writer as well who is writing other Star Wars stuff at, at, at Marvel. This seems like it should have been more of a Star a Marvel story. And you could have done, you could have told a different adventure set in the High Republic in a different slice of time with a different slice of a, a set of circumstances with maybe with new characters and new, new worlds, new civilizations to boldly go where, where no Jedi has gone before. Don't cross the streams. All right. And don't go over 88 miles per hour too. I mean, just keep to the speed limit, please. <laughs> But it was kind of a, and you know, I so I've been liking some of the most of these High Republic stories. This one was a miss. And the last one, I uh, the last Dark Horse book I, I read, and this is part four of four. It's Quick Stops, Volume Two, Issue Four, written by Kevin Smith and um, drawn by Ahmed Rafet and. Um, but see, it's got this manga style. It's, it's black and white. So you don't get, you know, so you don't lose anything with the coloring. In my humble opinion, sure, you have Bende dots, filters. Sure, this is all kind of just digital scrap. You know, this is drawn on a, on a, um, drawn on a a tablet oh look at dante so this is set after clerks three and it just has the continuing adventures of jay and silent bob Don and well randall at the store and um and this is millie who is she's one of the lead characters from Jay and Silent Bob reboot. And uh, well, hey, Dwayne Muth, good to see you, buddy. So, for me personally, I like this book. Uh, I didn't like it enough to buy it, I'll, I'll put it that way. <clears throat> I did get an issue of the last quick stops, you know, and uh, that was enough for me. Sure, I'm just glad to have read it. I'm a big of an old Kevin Smith fan. Going back a long way. Um, let's see. Put a log on the fire. <clears throat> let's see. I'm looking for. I'm looking for that. I've read two from a print called Xenoscope, and both of them revolve around uh, like, like golden age kind of properties. There's things that started a long time ago. One was called Oz, The Fall of Emerald City, issue one. And it's 22 pages of content. And uh, when... Part one of three, when the fallen of Oz begin to return to the lands of the living, Dorothy, Glinda, and all their allies must join forces to discover the cause and fight against this faithful event before Emerald City falls for good. Oh. <laughs> Did I close that? Uh-oh. Boomer moment. Boomer. Zooming with the boomer. Yeah, so this is Dorothy. She's busty. She's curvy. She's pretty. I mean, oh, how problematic. 
Look, it's flying monkeys. They're deadly. They have a deadly edge, these flying monkeys do. And so this is, you know, it's just some continue a continuation of a previous one. But uh, it was okay, you know. It was. And the other one from Xenoscope was um, Winnie the Pooh has fallen into the public domain. And Bambi must be in it, too, because this... And this was actually pretty fun. This is a three issue run. This is something I might pick up. This is coming. This is coming out this Wednesday. So once again, I'll lift the door. I'll tell you this one. If I see this in the wild, um, I will pick this up. Yes, and because it's fun, and it's going to be three issues, and it it really has a good action story, kind of basic story to it. And it's this is Winnie the Pooh versus Bambi. It's Pooh versus Bambi. Issue one of three. In war, there are rules, but the forest has none. Abandoned by his country, betrayed by those he once called family, and hunted by those who want nothing more than to keep him as a trophy. Pooh is on a mission, and no amount of honey will sate his thirst. He wants revenge. Dun, dun, dun. It's Pooh versus Bambi. Um, there's some couple of, uh, that's the wraparound cover, you know, Pooh and then that's Bambi. And, uh, it's, it's deep on somewhere deep within the hundred acres woods. And we have, it's just like, they're a war team. You, you have, you have an Eeyore, you have a, a rabbit, you have, uh, an owl, you have a Tigger, you have a Pooh and you have Bambi as well. And uh, there are some kind of black ops kill team, kind of like, you know, um, like Arnold Schwarzenegger's team in, in Commando, something like that. And over the years, the, um, the um, Bambi finds the truth of like what they were happened. We weren't grown in, 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 in vats. We were, we were, we had, we, we had a, we had a, we had a, a past. <laughs> oh, <laughs> top secret. And it breaks the team up. And Pooh goes on his own way. And he splits from the whole program. And he's in hiding. And after after he apparently kills Bambi. And like years later. <laughs> oh, bother. That's great. Um... <laughs> and it's kind of like Rambo, <laughs> and he's a bit like this is great. I, and the and the end of it has this, uh, and he gets found out, of course, and then they come in to get him. But it's the good guys who want to use him to be on the secret team again instead of the bet. This, this is Piglet. <laughs> That's great. It's General Christopher Robin, silly old bear. There you go. And then we there's there's a there's your your comic book. How's that? It's that's Pooh versus Bambi number one. I'll pick that up if I see it. Awesome. We have a shitload of Marvel comics. We do. There's a whole bunch of Marvel comics. Yeah. So you have What If Venom, number three. Now this is just What Ifs. Um, yeah, that's your, that's your, don't sleep on this one. If you can find it, pick it up. It's on Zenoscope print. So who knows where you're going to find this? Maybe talk to your people at your local comic book shop. Maybe Yule Carter has your copy. Contact Yule Carter at Fantastic Comics of Berkeley, California. His deets are in the description. I have I order comics from him as well. Woo! That's true. Uh, there is a Peach Momoko variant cover for this. I'm kind of on the fence about that. Yule knows I have a weakness for the Peach Momoko variant covers. There is a Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man, um, from last two weeks ago and this coming 
Wednesday as well that have Peach Momoko variant covers. And he's got that last one for me. And I just asked him today, it's like, do you have the other one? Uh, you know, uh, I'll, you know, you know me and Peach Momoko variant covers. I am a sucker for them. But it's what if Venom, and it's just showing like, um, like what if Venom did not bind onto Eddie Brock? What if Venom instead glommed on to She-Hulk in issue one, Logan and Wolverine in issue two, and this one is Sorcerer Supreme, Stephen Strange, and um, and this one, yeah. So, yeah, it's uh. That's uh, that's what if Venom, yeah. It's just, it's just mashups, multiversally too, because what what ifs are always multiverse, but in some kind of just an Earth where everything was the same until you got to one inciting incident at one issue somewhere, like or in, in like, you know, what if Wolverine killed Hulk? I got that one. It's on my spinner rack. You know, this just history changes. You got something new, a new outcome. We have this week Ultimate Black Panther and Enter Storm and Killmonger. <clears throat> really good art by Stefan uh, Caselli. I mean, and, and and the the lowercase. I like the Paul Neary tribute page. The lowercase, pretty. It, it just it's seamless in the Ultimate Universe. I do, I don't know why. Here we go. This is our info dump. It's issue three. Here on our infinite uh, on our Ultimate Universe, Brian Hill is writing. Stefan Caselli is the artist. You know, and there there is your there's your indicia. And your credit page. Yeah, huh? Was it good? It was all right. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, I'm not buying this one. I'm not going to buy the Ultimates either. The Ultimates by Jonathan Hickman coming out soon. And that there's your Avengers title. Um, oh, my goodness, Mon Frere. How you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> That's my buddy Mario. We're in high school together. I hope you're still talking to your high school friends. It's good to have friends, you know. Um, it's good to keep them too. Keep keep take good care of your friends. They're found family. It's true. Um, there's Spider Woman issue number six by Stephen Fox and Iguara. Um, and you have this wonderful cover by Lennel Yu. And uh, Jessica Drew gets out of town and goes to Chicago. <clears throat> And um, here, here's your, here's your, 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 here you go. You want some info dump? You want to get caught up to speed and enjoy an issue of, of, of a Spider Woman? This is on the inside of every, every book. You have an info dump page. <clears throat> Usually on the, it's, it's got, yeah, on the, on the credits page. The Indicia will be at the back on the preview of next month's page. When she was a child, Jessica Drew's father rescued her from a fatal illness using a serum of irradiated spider biomaterial. The concoction not only cured her, but granted her adhesive fingertips and toes, enhanced speed and agility, a high concentration of pheromones, and the ability to fire biokinetic venom blasts. She's been an agent of Hydra, a super spy, a PI, an Avenger, known as Spider Woman. Dun, dun, dun. Awesome. Mario's in his way in his car on the way home from duty this weekend. Thank you very much. I'm a lifelong civilian and he's a, been a like an adult lifelong uh navy man. So uh thank you for your service, my friend and my brother. Um Starlight, Star Bright, the first star I punched tonight. Previously on Spider Woman, aka Jessica Drew, but not to be confused with anyone else. Like Aranya, um, that's Maya Corazon, Sophie Corazon, uh, Anna, Anya Corazon, um, or Julia Carpenter, 
Spider Woman. You'd know her because she had the venom looking black symbiote look, but it wasn't a symbiote. It was just like kind of like a replica of Peter's black suit. But I think she had like, you know, like long white boots and 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 long white gloves and and, and bubbies to, to, to say that she's a girl, you know. Well, who I'm not getting involved in any of those subjects here. All right. Um Spider-Woman has learned the monstrous truth. Her baby, Jerry, or it could be pronounced Gary, too, like the Irish way, was brainwashed and aged by Hydra, turning him into the villain, Green Mamba. <laughs> After a devastating fight between mother and son, Gary escaped, and Jessica was left reeling from her emotions. Confiding in Captain Marvel helped, as did her team-up with Spider-Boy, who remembers Gary despite everyone else's memory of him having disappeared when she was removed from the web of life and destiny. So was Spider-Boy. Spider-Boy was removed from the web of life and destiny. And nobody remembers Spider-Boy as well. Bailey Briggs, the supposed kid sidekick of Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And also... The same thing kind of happened to uh, to Bob Reynolds, the Sentry, who was one of the original Marvel superheroes, but was take memory of him was taken out of the timeline. So when he came back, no one remembered him because this is all retcon. You know what I mean? And um, but the Sentry ended up being an avatar of the Void, this like big bad, this evil, you know. <laughs> Dwayne Wooth and his toilet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jessica still has a lot to process, though. Maybe heading west will help her figure out how to save her son. There is a Peach Momoko variant cover for this. Gosh, I'm a sucker for those. I really am. dangle that in front of me and I'll be like, oh, I got none of the, I don't collect Spider-Woman, but here I am. I'm a Star Wars fan and I want to enjoy Star Wars stuff. And here we have Star Wars Mace Windu. It's versus Jabba and the, Jabba the Hutt's hit squad. Bum, bum, bum. It's Mark Bernadine, George Auntie, Dexter Vines. And um, Andrew Dollhouse is the colorist. Um... I usually like George Auntie's art. There's been a few times where George Auntie has really, really, you know, left it flat. And um, this has kind of been a boring series. I'm not too familiar with Mark Bernadine's writing. Um, I know that he's Kevin Smith's co host at the Cantina or Fat Man Beyond. And. Um, like, I, if I'm a Hindu, does that mean I cannot prepare any dishes with beef in them? Well, you know, uh, maybe that's my karma to stick around, you know, be, you know, eating all these cheeseburgers. You know, I'm an American, so um, I'm not sure. That's a good question, though. Hello, AL. Good to see you. How is everything going? If anyone likes... That stuff, more power to them. Exactly. I mean, um, who's reading what? Um, like, are you reading Spider Boy? By Dan, fuck you, Slot. Uh, Slot will block Tavius himself. You know, I can't. I think this is decent. This is decent. Spider, Spider Boy's okay. Dan Slot's been writing Spider Man for the better part of two decades. Okay, he's he's got a lot of Spider Boy stories. He's written, you know, think of it like a baseball hitter. Okay, if you if you're hitting 300, that means you're only hit hitting a base hit three out of ten times, a base or an extra base hit three out of ten times. Uh, you know, the other seven times you're you're either striking out or you're grounding out or flying out. Okay, that's it, and uh, and you know, so he's got a good. Let's say I think that Dan Slott has a really good on-base percentage, a good slugging percentage. You know what I mean? He's good with runners and scoring position. That's, you know, he's an asshole, though. And I'm not going to uh, spend 
my money on him. Let's see what you got to say. I didn't get anything this week, and I also won't read anything by slot. Dan Sloth. And Nuke says, am I reading the Thrawn comic? I am reading that. It's okay. I'm reading the new one, Thrawn Alliances. That's the one that usually ends up in my um, in my pirate chest. And uh, I'm not sure if... Uh, when did Thrawn Alliances come out as a book? It's a book book. Because Timothy Zahn wrote the story, but Jody Hauser has got the adaptation. And uh, ah, see, exactly. You know? And, and, and AL said, won't read anything by Tom King, Mark Wade, or Dan Slott. And you can put me down for Mark, uh, Greg Pack, and Alyssa Wong, and Becky Cloonan, Tim Sheridan, uh, Donnie Cates, uh, David Papus. Um, all six of these people I had no direct interactions with. I've been blocked on Twitter out of just adjacency. But Spider Boy is decent. Let's see, you know, here's the. Hey everybody! It's our info dump page. This, and which is it's really helpful. Okay. Bailey Briggs was a normal kid before Madame Monstrosity turned him into one of her experiments. She spliced his DNA with a spider, giving him spider strength, spider speed, the ability to climb walls, and a spider sense that were that warns him when other people are about to be in danger. It doesn't let up until he helps them. So annoying. He spent years as Spider-Man's sidekick before he was erased from the web of life and destiny. Now, nobody remembers him, not even Spider-Man. When he returned, his mom was missing. So now he lives in the Feast Center, uh, you know, with it's, 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 um, it's for unhoused youth, apparently. Sometimes he wishes he could be just a kid, but... He must find a way to survive and rebuild his reputation as Spider Boy. Dun, dun, dun. Bailey Briggs ran away after his friend. Oh, after his friends. What? Let's see. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Accused him of monstering out and running amok across New York City. It really was Boy Spider. A Madame Monstrosity creation spliced together from leftover Spider Boy DNA, who shares Spider Boy's memories. Yeah, and Spider Boy in that last issue, you know, called him brother and can speak to him in his own language. You know, like the rest of the world, Madame Monstrosity doesn't remember Spider Boy, but his neck bears her barcode, so she knows she made him. Now she wants him back and determines his friend, Christina Shu is the best way to lure him. So, Helifino, who, is, who, who just learned a joke Bailey told to cheer him up, gave Madame Matrosa the idea for his transformation, captures both Christina and Spider-Boy. I'm literally reading this, okay? This is somebody wrote this sentence. I wonder if it was Slot himself, or maybe it was an assistant editor. I don't know. Back at Madame Monstrosity's in lab, we learn the story of how Spider Boy's absence embarrassed her in front of her idol, the High Evolutionary, aka Dr. Windham, when he was disgusted by all her other human animals. The human human animals. Human animals. Since then. Madame Monstrosity has doubled down on her experiments, and with Spider Boy knocked out, it looks like poor Christina may be next. It's usually two um, tales in here with different artists. Uh, the Man Upstairs by Paco Medina, and So You're a Human Animal Now by Julian Shaw. Um, yeah, and that's your that's your Spider Boy info dump page. You have to you have to know that much. <laughs> Zahn wrote his Dark Force Rising trilogy, the first Thrawn trilogy in 1991, around the same time that Dark Horse also published Dark Empire 1. And they had this new thing called Lucas Books. And that was where Lucasfilm Story Group came out of. Um was Lucas Books, and it was their responsibility to make to be the custodians 
and the gatekeepers of continuity, canon, and lore, and making sure that everything interconnected. So anything that ended up in print or, you know, that it had to add to the Star Wars story and it had to be cleared by that level of editorial. Love it. Love it. And um, Nuke says he's really just reading Energon Universe stuff. Cool. Glad you're liking it. I am too. Um, what else do we got this week? The Spectacular Spider Men by, uh, by, um, is it Greg Weissman? Yeah. And Greg Weissman and pencils by Umberto Ramos. And, um, it's about Spider Man teaming, the Spider Men teaming up. It's Peter. And Miles getting into hijinks and cracking wise. And, um, uh huh. I, you, I love Umberto Ramos's art. I really do. I really, really do. But I, you know, just the, the modern coloring is just, yeah. And there you go. There you go. Modern coloring, modern lettering, the the cut and paste, onomatopoeia. But overall, I love his line work and I love his faces and, and stuff. You know, it's a really good Daredevil right there. I think that's cool. I'm a huge fan of Umberto Ramos. I don't think he, he does no wrong. It's just... Uh, <laughs> AL says, Mild Morels was just Peter Parker light. You know, I just, I wish, you know, he was, he was, Miles was Spider-Man in, in his own universe when Peter was dead. There is no struggle over the name. There's only maybe a certain laziness to not wanting to give him his own agency and his own code name. He's half Puerto Rican. We're not Hombre Araña. That, that's Hombre Araña is uh, means Spider Man in Spanish, and that's what Spider Man is known as under the Rio Grande. You know, there's a whole huge landmass from from the Rio Grande to Tierra del Fuego. That's Mexico, all the way down to South America. It's a Latino culture. Like everyone speaks Spanish, with the exception of the Brazilians who speak Portuguese, but they are still Latino. <laughs> And um, that's my new thing. If I'm, you know, talking to, you know, crowd funders, I'm like, do you have a Spanish version ready? And if you don't, why not? I mean, you're ignoring. There are over 1 billion people between North and South America. And most of them are Latino culture people, speaking Spanish speaking people or Portuguese speaking reading people. You know, but the majority of them speak and read Spanish. And love things like anime and manga so and superheroes and rock and roll. I mean, like, there's just, like, I just want to tell, like, everyone out there who's making their own comic book, where's your Spanish version? I want to see that, too. Let's see what happens here. This is an interesting issue. This is Roxxon presents Thor number one, uh, Al Ewing, but really, really tight. Line art by Greg Land, and it's just it's rocks on the energy company, perpetual threat to the Marvel, you know, universe where the big bads live and they make unnecessary technology and energy and are like in league with AIM and Hydra and all this stuff's going on. Um, well, they're the big bad corporation and they have bought. Thor, their version of Thor, and they're creating a Thor comic book. And something about this also is affecting our Marvel Thor on some kind of intrinsic level, because perhaps maybe it's the power of myth 
in, in the power of story affecting myth. And if you affect the story, you affect the myth. So this is somewhat, you know, the, so this rocks on fake Thor is, um, is, is going to come into conflict with our traditional Thor Odinson. And, um, so this is this is a pretty fun issue to be honest with you. It's just it's it's pretty much standalone uh, to be read between the last two issues of 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 wow. Look, we got some really prime Greg Land here. You know, he was accused of like boxing uh, corn stars, and <laughs> but this was this was fun, and it's not it wasn't very serious, and. Um, yeah, it was okay. And it just and it fits in with the immortal Thor that's ongoing right now. So uh yeah, it, it it's 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 set between issues nine and ten of of immortal Thor. And it's and it's pretty and that, that was pretty fun for a stupid cash grabby kind of comic book. Yeah, back cash grab. <laughs> that's right. I got my Cecil gear. Cecil says he broke up the Jack show. I think the Jack show is done. John Malin is bailed from the Jack show. Um, Kelsey Shannon bailed from the Jack show a few months ago. Um, so now it's just Anna and Cecil. That's the act show. And uh, let's see if they can keep it going. I mean, geez. I mean, I just, I don't know what to say. Um, I watched that whole thing play out and uh this is why we call uh, people like me call for understanding and unity i like what malin has to say for himself and cecil was kind of talking some kind of common sense of human nature and you know they both had good points but they ended up sticking each other with these points you know and um nothing exactly nothing lasts forever you know so they had a great ride, you know, like four or five years, the Jack show. And it quit too? I didn't hear that part. I'm still watching the Shane Davis show that John came on after his dirt. That was it. John had the show a show called The Dirt on the Rumble. And I couldn't, I didn't, I don't watch Rumble. Then I tried to tune in. He had already privacy, uh, privated and, um, Um, but I, like I, I've been watching the Shane Davis show called Let's Talk made yesterday. It's five hours long though, so it's just like Malin does show up on it and talk about it, and I think Anne is on it too. So I'll catch up on that, and I'll, I just tune in. I wake up. I used to wake up at three thirty every morning um, until it became four thirty. They changed, my hours changed at work. We uh, he pushed it. Uh, you know, the chef pushed it up an hour. Um, so instead of coming to work at 6 a.m., I come to work at 7 a.m. Um, but I was waking up at 3.30 in the morning for years, for a better, over, for over a decade. So since I savvied on to this YouTube stuff a couple of years ago, um, and coming back from lockdown and shit, waking up to the Jack show has been an every Friday thing for me. Turning it, tune in right at 3, 3.30, I wake up, I turn, I tune on, I, I tune it, turn it on. And we see how drunk Cecil is, <laughs> you know, something like that. And either that, it's just wrapping up, rewind it. You know, if someone like Alex Stein's on, I fast forward and skip over to his shit. I cannot stand that guy. Sorry. Hey, this, there's people on, like, you know, in these shows that you don't have to like and you don't have to watch. I mean, I don't watch Alex Jones. I don't watch Alex Stein. I don't watch Melanie Mack. I don't watch Brittany Venti. Uh, I don't watch Ads from Heel versus Babyface. You know, there are just certain creators that don't, I just, I not going to unwind watching and there's no point because it's, it's just, it's, it's not my cup of, you know, they have great, they, 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 they have plenty of viewers, you know, screw it. There was Miles Morales issue 19 written by Cody Ziegler. Um, this was a really decent issue. It's called Retribution Part 3. And um, 
I think it's the end of yeah, it's the end of this 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 retribution arc where it's just a big old fight between uh, Miles and uh, and Rabble, the technopath. You want to see this? Let's look at Miles Miles's um, info dump page here. Years ago. High school student Miles Morales was bitten by a genetically altered spider and gained incredible arachnid-like abilities, the proportional speed, strength, and agility of a spider, adhesive fingers and toes, the power to direct a bioelectric charge like a sting, or to form a sword-like weapon to camouflage himself to the point of invisibility and to detect approaching danger using his precognitive spider sense. He hid these abilities at first until a hero inspired him to use them to make the world more just. He is Miles Morales Spider-Man in Retribution. Part three. After the gang war, the gang four. <laughs> Lord Thoth does watch everyone. See, Lord Thoth, see, this is great. One thing I appeal to are people like Lord Thoth. People like myself, like Mexican Iron Man, like 200 Watt Studio. There's a whole shitload of us that are on everyone's live chat, that will watch everyone's shows. And we are the interconnect. Like, there's a huge Venn diagram. And it's like, um, it, it, it's just like, we're, we're all here for this. And we kind of know each other now because we've been doing this for years. We, we know, you know what to expect. You know, we know Russell Hall is going to give Anna a hard time. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know? And um, I, I just like, I just, um, yes, that's right. And, and, and Lord Thoth wrenches everywhere, too. This is true. Um, after the gang bore, Spider-Man knew he needed to take a more proactive approach to stopping crime. His first mission was to track down the technopath, Rabble, and try to extend a helping hand to her. When he did manage to find her, leaders of the Cape Killers, Agent Gao, had gotten to her first. Desperate to stop... And Agent Gao is actually showing up in Deadpool right now because Cody Ziegler just started with his issue one over there. Um, let's just let you know. <laughs> um, desperate to stop the shutdown of the Cape Killers, Gao made a deal with Ravel for upgraded tech for her and her team that put their bodies directly under Gao's control. With their begrudgingly friendly relationship with Spider-Man holding their back, the Cape Killers proved to be more formidable than ever. Even when Spider-Man stopped pulling his punches and unlocked a 100% of his spider strength. And uh, this comes down to uh, to like the big fight between Sp Miles, Ravel, the Cape Killers, and on uh, and, and so Miles had his own clone saga. So there's a big kind of dim-witted clone version of Miles. It's called Shift. So he's kind of like a friendly Bizarro version. Of Miles, and so Miles has taken Shift in as his brother, and is by the end of this issue, introduces Shift to his family, his own family, and, and being like Shift, this is my clone, he's my brother, and he's one of us. Mom, Dad, this is your, this is this is my clone, your your clone son, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And it was cute, but it was like, this is actually a really decent Marvel superhero comic book. I got to tell you, you know, even with my things against like digital shit uh, here and there, not bad at all. Uh, and I've been reading this for several months now. And they, these have all been in my, um, my digital uh, pirate chests. And just to, just to, 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 to say like, you know, when it comes to as he's just too high test he's too explosive too toxic for me and i don't mean saying toxic as in just like a put down more like you know what you're going to get if you tune into heel versus baby face okay and if you don't want that don't tune into it it's that simple live and let live you know same with melanie mac i mean i just i just she's not my cup of she's not my cup of tea you know she's very caustic and um 
I'm not a gamer. So, I mean, I see the crossover in, in, in our in our shows and stuff. And I watch SimCast. I watch the shit out of SimCast. That's like Monday mornings. I wake up. I turn on SimCast. I love Chrissy. I love Anna. I love Lila. I love, you know, uh, Keanu Thompson, the, the, the crew, when they have Ashton Birdie on. Oh, she's so pretty. Wow. And they have the, yeah, these, just the sound of chicks talking. Chrissy Simcast, it's like the, it's the reverse, the view. The view is on ABC. It's a daytime show of like women, liberal women just yapping away. And well, here's your middle to conservative alternate for that. Simcast. It's pretty good. And I've been watching it for a few years now. So, but like, you know, Brittany Venti's on that show. And that's where I was introduced to Brittany Venti. And that's where I kind of left Brittany Venti, you know, to just, and, uh, and yeah, but Chrissy is fun. Chrissy is, yeah. Got to meet her at uh, her and Anna and Zia at Boston Fan, uh, Fan Expo 2022. We saw Simcast live. That was really fun. And, um, but yeah, it's like, I'm not going to put, I would rather have unity. You know, I will say something. I'll, I'll, come, I'll say this fucking out loud and straight up. The whole thing between Ethan and Friday Night Tights. Yeah, the, I was there. I saw the whole thing happen in real time. Ethan did say he called them all zeros. I get it. And Ethan did try to back that up. He tried to apologize. Okay. I don't think this is Ethan's fault. This is Az's fault. It's all Az's fault for not being able to just say, hey, fine, whatever. People just, I don't know. I, I shoot from the hip. Making content's like, it's not hard, but it's not easy. And you got to have good radio and you got to keep talking and you got to be engaging. And you just, so there's a lot of shooting from the hip. There's a lot of improvisation and there's a lot of Almy Newt stuff that go into throwing a show together. And I can see like Ethan just saying something stupid. I say stupid shit all the time. One of the reasons I can't watch Addis is because he said something so stupid. I can't fucking even cope with him anymore. Especially when he does his whole fucking ap apoplectic rage thing. I just like, that's not chilling out for me. But he, the whole apoplectic rage thing, he got over Ethan being like, no, my mates, you insulted my mates kind of thing. It's just like, well, I think if there was a bit, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I mean, and Ethan just went with it, man. He loves that shit, that drama stuff. He just, I, he's, he's a gadfly for it, man. But, um, and it might all be broken. Yeah, seriously. But, um, being like, wow, this is, might not be a place to come and chill out anymore and unwind. This is just a place for like people getting wound up. I'm not a fucking toy. You can't wind me up. You know what I mean? And watch me go spin around, spin around, spin around. All right. I mean, just, but that's like, you know, and I don't want to contribute to that either, but been watching these shows for a couple of years now, as we all have. But I just think if there was, I just see like, if you want to use the parlance of, of our, of our spheres, Part, correct me if I'm wrong, but only the SJWs, the progressives, they don't have forgiveness. They don't use forgiveness and they don't let, you know, that they don't, they, 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 I mean, just, we could have used a healthy dose of forgiveness, especially after Ed Piscor's murder. And especially after, and, and it's something about the, the, the high level of cancel culture with, you know, John and, and Shane. I know they don't like Ethan, but, you know, just... And Cecil was, and this is why Cecil got in trouble. He was saying like, no, 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 no. It's, it is guilt by association. You know what I mean? You're, you're totally ignoring human nature. And John's like, are you kidding? Are you really saying that it's guilt by association? And that's what kind of what broke up the band right there. Boom. Wow. I said, I got to still get filled in with like what Anna says, but let's fill ourselves in right now with giant size Hulk issue. Number one, it's the 50th anniversary of giant size Marvel comic books. And this is one half a new story. This was $6.99. It's 47 pages of, of story and art. And the, the end of it is, for me, the best part of it. Because it's a reprint of, um, of a Peter David, Dale Keown book. 
Uh, it, it's Hulk 372. And it's just something simple you can just jump into. It's It's got a Hulk. It's got Bruce. It's got Betty. And it's got fucking Dale Keown pencils. Uh, this is this this happens right after the last issue of Incredible Hulk. So this is you need this in your Hulk collection. Philip Kennedy Johnson is writing this, and um, it, and this happens right after New Orleans. Um, but look, you know what I mean. Here we have, you know, Hulk's a loud comic book, and look, you know, and I want to say too is like the more you blow this up, the more grainy. The image gets, yet look at the onomatopoeia. It's crystal clear because it's not part of the art. It's all dropped and dragged. Now, if that was onomat hand-drawn onomatopoeia, like Nick Klein has gotten me really like used to in this very ish in this very comic book, then <laughs> you know that would have like kind of pixelated when you blow it up too. But you know what I mean. This is giant size Hulk. Number one, this fits in with the rest of your Hulk story, and um, it's okay. You know what I mean? It's get, you know, it's getting kind of like Monster of the Week. Yeah, she's still a doll at the end of the comic. You know what I mean? It doesn't progress the story exactly. Yeah, and uh, it's it's yeah. If you if you if you bought the rest of the Incredible Hulk by Philip Kennedy Johnson, you're gonna want this as well because it, it's part of it. I used to support CG, but I do not anymore. They act like Mark Wade does. In a way, sure. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. <clears throat> yeah, I've been enjoying the new Hulk, but I couldn't waste my money on this issue. You know, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, what's it going to be worth to a, you know, in your collection? Do you do you really need it? Do you really, is it going to make or break it? Like if if, 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 you, if you miss out on this one issue or not? Exactly. Um, what else we got? We got Ghost Rider Final Revenge by Ben Percy. We have the new Ghost Rider out there. Um, getting vengeance. Yeah, and it's I I really think I think this is going either five or six issues. Uh, I think this is a temporary Ghost Rider. I think by the end of it, there will be an, an even more newer and permanent. Go a uh, spirit of vengeance on a motorcycle, and it's probably going to be um, what's your face from the last Ghost Rider book. I'm putting money on that, I'll put twenty dollars on that, okay? Maybe two dollars on that. I'll put two dollars on that, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it was like I am paying $7.99, I am paying $4.99 for. For uh, for facsimile issues, though, <laughs> I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I am a sucker for those facsimiles. I'm, you know, uh, and anyway, with Dwayne Muth there, I hope you, I hope you're able to answer a question for us when we come up to it. When we play, what's in the bag? That's right. What's in the bag? That's right. What's in the bag of comic books from our local comic book shop? This week we'll find out. Very shortly at the end of the show. Uh, Follow the House of X number four by Jerry Duggan. Um, um, it's this is just, yeah, a lot of fight. There's a lot of fighting going on in here. That's great. It's a lot of apocalypse kicking ass. Um, you know, um, it's, um, it's the end game. All everything's coming together. It's the final battle of the Krakoan age. Are you ready? And um yeah, it's just a lot of fighting. Um a lot of blah blah blah. And um that's about it. At the end of it, Storm shows up and she wants to kick ass. And what has Storm been doing? Storm's been uh, re re resurrecting Magneto. So he'll show up too, hopefully. Who cares? I mean, yeah, whatever. We have Dead X-Men number four of four. So thank goodness this one is over. This was terrible. Uh, here we go. Yeah, of course I'll show this one. 
Here's the color purple that's everywhere in comic books. Look at that background. That's it's, it's, it's so thoughtless. But there's no, you know, very little shit going on here. This is like cut and paste. I, I, did you think that they actually drew all this? Maybe. Don't know. But, um, but yeah, look at all this use of modern purple. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really bitched about modern purple in a while, haven't I? Well, because remember, modern purple really is blue finally getting to realize the importance of red and working with red. Indeed. Uh, Steve Fox is the writer. You have three artists. And um, this is just really cash grabby and um, it's it's not that good. And um, it's, Happy 420. Can't show. Don't, don't smoke up on TV like that. You'll lose your monetization for that episode. Um, it's a Steve Fox book. What do you expect? Exactly. If you read Dark X-Men before this too, that started good for a couple of issues, then pff, flatlined like right at the end. Same thing here. This just couldn't, couldn't land it, you know? Um, the X books are ending, um, very shortly in the next couple of months by June. See, it's already April, May, June. So two more months. And then, yeah, by June, July, we'll have the new issues. Number one, it is the end of the Krakoan age. And both sides need to concentrate on their own comics and build a world and cultivate an audience. That's true. You know, I'm a big fan of Ethan. I watch all those stupid trash casts. I don't need to watch Eric July. I watch trash casts. It's like, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, the worst I ever say about him that it's, he's a bit much sometimes. He, but guess what? Yours truly, this guy right here, I'm a bit much sometimes. So I got a lot of empathy for that. And I know what it's like to put my foot in my mouth. And I know what it's like to say something from the hip and the instantly regret it. I do know this. And, you know, this this situation could have been solved a lot quicker if, you know, maybe if like the, if, if if Ethan was considered forgivable. And then it's just that's it's only escalated from that point, you know. This could have been solved by just you know a long, but no. I mean, this is outrage culture it does fuel a lot of this. And um, X Men haven't been heroes since twenty eighteen or so, maybe even more. <laughs> Thank God, Aiden. Yeah, I mean, it just it. Maybe it would have been completely different if Jonathan Hickman got to finish the story he started. If he didn't have all the, you know, the X slack interference. Oh my gosh. It you, Alyssa Wong. It's Captain Marvel number seven. This thing is going, you know, it's legacy number 191. So you know that um, this is going to go on a little longer than what you think. It's going to, you know, at least eight more, nine more issues to get up to 200. All right, that's what I that's what I think. Born to a Cree mother and a human father, former U.S. Air Force pilot Carol Danvers became a superhero when a Cree device activated the latent powers. Now she's an Avenger and Earth's mightiest hero, Captain Marvel. Petty thief Yuna Yang was tailing was attempting to steal the Nega the the neg the 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 the. the, 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 the the bands. I, do, I don't want to come close to saying that. <laughs> they just call them the negative bands now, or you know, 
from Genesville, son of the original Captain Marvel. So now it's got that, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed it had to have some kind of corporate syzygy with the Marvel's movie. But you had that whole thing of um, going back to this to the Bronze Age source material. The Bronze Age Captain Marvel um, started out being Earth based, and then came a point where Rick Jones, sidekick, human, teenager, troubadour, uh, Avenger, Hulk, sidekick, um, had uh, the the negative bands, and when he clicked them together. He switched places with Marvel, Captain Marvel. And so he ended up in the negative zone. And so it was just more of like one could only be there at the same time. Like they had to switch places. So now they've gone back to that classic formula. Yuna Yang has the negative bands. And so does Carol Danvers. So they switch places just like Rick Jones and Marvel did way back in the mid 70s. Um, and which kind of complements whatever shenanigans was going on in the Marvel movie that like, so when they use their powers, they switch spaces. So the three of them, Marvel, binary and, and Captain Marvel, binary, uh, Monica Rambeau and Ms. Marvel, uh, Kamala Khan would switch places all, you know, something like that. I didn't see the movie. Not many people did. What? I am the only person I know that you know that likes current detective comics. Isn't Batman Lost the City yet again? Kinda. Yeah. I mean, oh, there's so much to like about it. Dwayne Muth hates it because he uh he doesn't like Rams Z uh Ram V a lot. Of uh, I won I for one got turned on to Ram V with dark, uh, rare flavors. Uh and then I really liked his six issue uh the vigil on DC's We Are Legends. It was like just new heroes, new stories. Um, I really enjoyed that. But this is just, it's this is a slow burn. The art in it is, is, is over the top, really hyper detailed, really good artwork. Um, and it's a slow burn. It is a narrative and thematic opposite to the, the vapid work that Chip Zdarsky is doing over on Batman proper. Um, you know, and I love Jorge Jimenez's artwork on that. He's the only reason why I buy sporadically Zdarsky's Batman. I don't even I don't even have a reason to buy Zdarsky's Batman anymore because we all know Failsafe is going to be one of the big bad three in the Absolute Power Summer event, which we all know should be spinning out of that will be the ultimate, I mean, the, the Absolute DC Universe. See, the whole key is in the word Absolute. You read it here first, you know. <laughs> hey, Fear Monarch, good to see you. Rare Flavors is great. Issue 5 releases this Wednesday. Get your copy. Captain Danvers is desperate for readers. Fail and fail again. It's funny because the um, there was a Captain uh, Marvel mini that just finished, I think, in six issues. Was it Dark Harvest? Dark, Dark Tempest? Uh, it was written by Annie Nascenti, and it was actually the best use of the character of Carol Danvers, in my humble opinion, in a long time. Um, you know, kept a lot of that stuff that they've kind of pushed on her, you know, the toughness, the unlikability, but there was a likability underneath that. You know, there's so, I think it's a fem it's an academic feminist thing that you don't have to be liked to be respected which is kind of true. It works for men too, you know? But when it comes to heroic characters, I think it's a little different. So if you make your your lead unlikable, I mean, and unbeatable, I mean, we have to root for our heroes. We have to, you know, have reasons to root for our heroes and we have to somewhat find them likable, you, the, the, you know, seriously. Even Tony Stark, he's likable. He might be a bit of a pompous ass a bit, sometimes a womanizer, you know? Um, but he's likable. He's funny. He'll even foot the bill for for, 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 for supper. He's like that. <laughs> when Ramsey can write a one and done or two part stories. I don't know. But people are really liking his stuff over on um uh, 
on image he's doing uh the sixth finger um which is crossing over with dan waters the one hand so they're they, they're, they have like interlocking covers and everything they're having fun those guys are having fun doing that i'll tell you that but um this is a yeah this is captain marvel 7 and this is a book that checks all the boxes um I, I, you know, even if I liked it, I wouldn't buy it because Alyssa Wong, you has me blocked on Twitter for, for, for her own reasons and, um, nothing to do with a direct interaction because it's just, I'm a stinky person. We have Black, uh, Widow and Hawkeye number two by Stephanie Phillips. Um, now this is something that I've noticed from, uh, don't know who is writing Detective Comics next, but I do know that Ram V's tenure is coming up to a close. Maybe someone like Jason Aaron. You never know. That's a guess. Who deserves it? Does Joshua Williamson deserve? Does he have a Detective Comics arc in him? Does he have a year? He just did a great year on Superman, and he hasn't stopped. You know, uh, that's I'm a big convert for Joshua Williamson. Gee, Duke is amazing. Cobra Commander is really fun. Um, Green Arrow, I'm not buying, but it's entertaining. It's a that is a just a stock, straight up, normal, typical DC superhero book. If you think that they don't make comic books for you anymore, you haven't been reading Joshua Williamson's Green Arrow. Uh, that is pretty much made for the DC comics fan. Uh, a lot of like that feeling that you had with Jeremy Adams' The Flash that went to Joshua Williamson's Green Arrow. Um, that's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> and um, me too, Lord Thought. Me too. I would. I would have a story. Yeah. Well, yeah. DC, call us. Seriously. But this is it's a Black Widow. She's on the hunt for Clint Barton, her best friend, her best friend from the movies, which has kind of made its way to the the books in a way, but. Black Natasha has a symbiote named Widow. So she's got these mashup characters. So it seems like that women and marginalized folk have like lots of mashup characters. It's to make sure that your cis normative hero types are sharing their power. That's I see the postmodern academia shit everywhere. Man, it's like, yeah. So this is black. This is look. I mean, look at the formatting of this page. I just it kind of it's. it's I don't like it. <laughs> I know that Stephanie's name. That's supposed to be Paolo. Is that that Mattia? I don't. You know, Siri, but it's, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it just it just one week ago, and this it just has this back and forth narrative of like then and now, and um, this is very digital. And um, look at those backgrounds. Look, see, look, look, look at all that. I mean, it's like, it's just, it, uh, it just, it must be. Uh, I don't know. And there you go. Many years ago, see, it just like goes back and forth and back and forth. But um, not great. There's uh, Beware the Planet of the Apes, number four of four, 20th Century Studios, $3.99 for 26 pages of story and art. And uh, this is when I started noticing that I used to, I thought that all the 20th Century Studio stuff was just like four and five ninety nine, dollars but this is at the, at the $3.99 median cover price, which is interesting. Uh, this is set in the original Charlton Heston universe. And, um, pretty darn good i liked it it was entertaining um leading us to our last issue of um what about his batman and robin it's it's fun it's decent the art takes it i think simone de, de Mayo's art sucks me out of it it does because it's so it's 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 manga inspired fine um, it's very digital, so it's, it looks very modern. Because it's, it's a, a, a Batman and Robin should be selling to the to the scholastic crowd. 
you know, if you could publish this in a tank of on format, something that would, you can get into the hands of children, you know, this might sell. You know, it's Damian Wayne's first year in high school. He's 14, 15 years old now. Aging the Robins has a negative effect on Batman in the long run. Seriously, you need to, you got to keep the, you got to keep them an ideal age for a certain time, for, for, I mean, Damien was nine, 10 years old when he was introduced in Grant Morrison's Batman. Wow. It was 20 years ago, about oh, 15 years ago. And, um, Let's see what X-Men 171 Carol is binary slugs rogue through the roof of the X-Mansion then tells off Big Daddy X and the rest then she leaves that's Carol Danvers yeah I mean Carol like getting some comeuppance with the uh, way with Rogue too why does Rogue have a huge power set way back in Avengers it was it Avengers annual number five or was it 12 Rogue's first appearance is dumping Carol's body off of a off of a bridge leaving her for dead and um and 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 so so like rogue over over it was oversaturated with carol's powers and like kind of just that's why she's got you know, a baseline of flight super strength you know she she got that from ms marvel like 1981 i'm pretty sure cuz i think that has the columbia bike you know, you know, I love those. The Columbia um, bike contest on the top. So that's a key issue. It's got actually two issues. I think Madeline Pryor's first appearance uh, was in that as well, but as a character name and not the character that we know. And then the first appearance of Rogue. You know, key issues. We got Avengers Twilight, 35 pages. This is book five. It's for four ninety nine. You get thirty five pages of story and art. You get a wonderful Alex Ross cover. This is Chip Sadarsky doing his best. Uh, I love Daniel Acuna's art, and this has one more issue. It's just a six issue uh, mini. It's set in an alternate future. It's very much tonally like Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. So much so that. Steve Rogers has a, a, a an internal narrative, which is part of our narrative caption box. Um, we don't get thought bubbles anymore. We don't get we get we don't get thought balloons anymore. We get word balloons, of course, but thought balloons aren't a thing anymore. But we do get those in the narrative boxes. And so Steve Rogers' narrative boxes sound a lot like old Bruce Wayne does in Miller's Dark Knight Returns. That's what we're all, a lot, of, that's like what all of us are saying. Like, I hear that everywhere. And I thought it was like, oh, I heard that right off the bat. And, um, and all the heroes are old and the world has moved on a bit. And, um, and who's been pulling all the strings? Well, it's been the Red Skull. In Ultron. Yeah. And um, this is, it's it's okay. This has been okay. We've got four editors on this, though. Martin Biro, Annalise Bisa, Tom Brevoort. Those are the assistant. Okay, we have an assistant editor, Martin Barrow. Associate editor, Annalise Bisa. Editor, Tom Brevoort. This is true because Tom Brevoort is or was the Avengers group editor, and he's now moving over to X-Men. Jordan White is leaving. This is the end of the Cohen age. So this is a, so the Tom Brevoort age will pick up in June or July with the new issues number one. And editor-in-chief, uh, Akira, Yoshi, Akira uh, Yoshida. Akira Yoshida. C.B. Sabluski. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Avengers Annual number 10. Michael Golden. Yeah. I got to find that one. Oh, man. I, I just want a reader copy. I would I would, I would, pay, I would gladly pay $40 for like a 4.5 for that. You know, it's a, it's, I don't want it for 
the the rogue first appearance or the Madeline Pryor first appearance. I don't care. It is a great story. I want it for the Columbia bike contest banner because that's like that's my thing. I those populate my spinner rack. Seriously, I I would like to get all of those books. Four month span, fall of nineteen eighty one. Almost every Marvel book had the the the, the Columbia bike ad on the top of it. We know what that looks like because I show them off all the time. And um, I, I love the art. I've, Acuna's art. And it's James Stark. This is Tony's son. Tony's and, um, and Janet Van Dyne's son. Son of two Avengers. A real second generation Avenger. And uh, he's been duped by Ultron and Red Skull. And um, this is it's really good. I hope you're enjoying it. If you're re if you're if you're reading it, I hope you're enjoying it. Let's see. Now we have our DC books to to go through. I read Wonder Woman number eight. Um, Wonder Woman number eight. Let's look at her. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, oh, Susanna, don't you ride for me. I come from Alabama with the banjo on my knee. Hey, there we go. It's there. We have Wonder Woman by Tom King, art by Daniel Sampere. And um, let's let's look at a funny book. I'm gonna, I like these. The, look at this Daniel Champere artwork. I love the, the this. Okay, this is right now. Diana is maybe pretending to be captive, but she's facing off against the patriarchy, who's gloating and has her bound in a classic kind of like golden age. Bound Wonder Woman means she's powerless. If you tie her up, you know, the whole there is that whole bondage thing going on all the way back to Golden Age Wonder Woman. You know it, I know it, we know this. Um, a lot of people say that it's anti Christian. My friend Wes says that too, and um, uh, I'm not sure if it is because the devil is using scripture for his own purposes in this. That's a cliche. That's a Christian cliche. But the Daniel Sampere's line work in this is straight up like Milo Manara. I love Milo Manara. I love the feminine form. And this is just like, she's even got cute toes. I mean, she's got what great form. I mean, just like what beautiful, just like micro expression. Everything's in the face and the, in the, um, in the look of it all. I mean, this is look at the, this is some decent hatching. Look at the cross hatching under her neck in this shadow here. That's line work. It's in here in the chin. It's in here in the in the cheek. You see that? That's hatching. Those those, those parallel lines, and that's cross hatching. That's showing proper shadow and definition. I'm loving it. It's really good. The art in this is really tight. So here we go. Ephesians, but he's only he only has part of the quote, like wives be subject to your husbands are to the Lord. And th there's actually a lot more to that quote than just the, the, the first sentence, you know. So it's um and then she's like struggling against her bonds and they're cutting into her. That is the lasso of lies. And this is just this is a really good and look at the color palette. And this look at Diana's face. This is if you know Milo Minara's artwork, like Butterscotch or Click or Pandora's Eyes. I mean, this is just really good. This is some good work. I mean, it, look how pretty Diana is in these two panels. I mean, uh, just it's just, but he's but AL, he's not destroying Diana one bit by the end of this. This is all set up to pay off. This is actually, you know, he's he's showing 
like I said about baseball players, like he, this, he's just, he's getting on base with this one. You know, I, I think so. And this is just like a fever dream. This is, this is, this is the, this is a fantasy that the lasso of lies is trying to implant in her head and trying to break her will. And Steve would never talk like that. And um, but I just I'm really digging. Like, this is this was okay. This is an interesting struggle. <laughs> I love Yara Floor. Look how beautiful she is. She's this is this. This is some really good artwork. I mean, this 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 book is not all bad. And I even like the backup feature in this too about Trinity, uh, the the kid. And this is here comes the best part of it, because it's building tension, it's building tempo, and it's about belief and about believing what you've been told and about our nature. And here is Diana's inner monologue and she remembers her mother who's currently dead in, in the story that's why nubia is queen of the amazons so here's hippolyta this is great our rope is broken you told me by but my girl the girl who dressed in a mask and won her tournament and left the island despite all her mother's many many protestations you're too young you're too weak you're too small. You're too gentle. You can't save everyone. You can't save anyone. You would live a better life here, safe from follies, safe with your mother. Yes, my daughter, I told you the rope cannot be broken. But when did you ever believe me? Fucking A. Nice. Smash. Boom. Snap. Fucking A. Good fucking pacing good issue this is pretty good this was darn darn good and um don't be fooled i mean here you just gotta like a little like kind of like blow by blow of it i hope i don't get in trouble for showing all that and in the backup feature we got it's lizzie and she's gone back in time to train with an actual samurai and everything she does she kind of like messes up the timeline a little and you can see because damien and um, and John John's uniform changes and all of this quirky timeline stuff. Cutesy Ootsy, multiversey. Hey, hey, memes of destruction. How you doing, buddy? Are you still in Utah? I hope you and if you come to Boston for anything, let me know. We can always do lunch or, or supper. You know, hopefully on a Friday night or a Saturday. That's when I'm 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 best. But um yeah, that, that's Wonder Woman number eight. I mean, seriously, it wasn't bad. It really wasn't. We have Nightwing number 113. It's actually legacy issue number 300. And um, Tom Taylor, um, Marv Wolfman, and Michael Conrad show up for this. And um, it's got some great art. It's just a... Another issue of Nightwing and um, it's okay, but there's one part where um, Marv Wolfman comes in and uh, hey, DJ Ronnie G, what is up with thee? Good to see you. Um, where Marv Wolfman plays the owner of Marvin George's pizza shop. And uh, you see the tribute picture of George on the wall. And uh, they mentioned if George was still here, but it, was, it shows Marv, Marv Wolfman, as being like the owner of the pizza shop. And um, having this conversation with Dick Grayson at Nightwing, who is his creation. It's, it's, it's Marv Wolfman who graduated Dick from Robin to Nightwing in the pages of his new Teen Titans. When was that, like 1982? 
1983. And um, I bet you Dwayne Muth knows. He knows everything. He's got it. Thank you, Dwayne. And um, here we go. And Dick's like, hey, it's our night. Like, I want to, where do you want to go, Dick? You know, we, you can go, we're going to have supper anywhere you want. And he's like, okay, let's go to Marvin George's Pizza. 24-hour pizza place. Best in Blood Haven. And that's, that's you know, it's really good pizza. And there, that's, that's Marv Wolfman. And he got drawn into the comic book by Bruno Redondo. And um, there you go. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Marv. You know what I mean? And um, and see, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. That's that's George Perez right there. And that's Marv Wolfman. And for me, this has all the fields. I, I, I really enjoyed that. And um, but overall it was it was a good issue, you know. Uh, Batman Off World number four by Jason Aaron, fun. It's fun. It's um, if you don't think there's something out there for you, maybe give Batman Off World one, two, three, and four, or maybe wait for its collection. But it, it's it's good stuff. I'm not buying it, um, but it's got some really good Doug Mankey artwork. You, you're gonna find out who Punchbot is, and you're gonna love him too. He's like the breakaway character, and it's Batman, younger Batman, out in space, honing his skill set intergalactically. It's fun stuff. Titans number 10. It's some just basic Titan story by Tom Taylor involving Raven's brother and Raven's true nature. What's up with Raven right now? And Trigon. It's, um, this is all going somewhere, you know, and it's, you know, Trigon is probably the next, it's, it's always been a big bad of the Teen Titans. Sure. There was Batman Superman's World's Finest number 26, which has Mr. Mixicoplick, and it's got Batmite. So it's got these fifth dimensional imps uh, fighting other fifth dimensional imps. So if the Justice League had little fifth dimensional imps, um, here we go, 1983. Thank you, Dwayne Muth. Exactly. <laughs> I knew you'd know. Exactly. Um Batman Superman's World's Finest 26. So if there are heroic imps, there are also villainous imps as well, teaming up with their inspiration. So you have uh, Sinestro Might with Sinestro. And you have Paramite with the Parasite. And so it goes. But it's really cool. Um... It's a, now we do, we can complain about Mark Wade until the until the the cows come home. Um, he says a lot of stupid shit on the internet. Who says more stupid shit than Ethan Van Skyver and Mark Wade? You're looking at him right here. I say I say so much stupid shit on the internet. It's it's, <laughs> it's but yeah, we got some great Dan Mora art. Uh, oops, what's the wrong one? Let's see. And present screen. Present screen. Share screen. Ha ha. See, yes, yeah, so that's and that's classic Sinestro too. Years before he became leader of this of the Yellow Lantern Corps, the Sinestro Corps, you know, and they finally they were about to put Hal Jordan down for the count, and um, but who wants superpowers? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> and Robin's like, sure, I will, but look at this Robin costume. So. Mr. Mistleplick, Ms. Mysticleplick gives Robin some temporary superpowers. And see this thing? Like, thank Mizzle stuff. Mysticleplick. Robin's doing that on purpose. This is all set up to pay off because when the next issue, he's going to say Kittleskim. And that's what's going to put Mixleplick saying his name backwards, returning to the fifth dimension because he said his name backwards. This is all set up to pay off. 
But I mean, this is based on the original Bronze Age Earth 3 Robin. I mean, Earth 2 Robin, adult Robin outfit. His second look. His first look was a Batman uniform with the Robin R in the center of the chest with a domino mask instead of a cowl and a yellow insert to the uh, to the collar to his cape. Uh, further in the mid seventies, with All Star Squadron uh, and their and the appearance of of uh, Skyman and Power Girl, Robin got a new adult costume, and it had these yellow slacks, green boots, uh, green tights, and I mean a, a green briefs. This style of of utility belt and an orange top with, with a, a regular R on it. So this has more of a stylized kind of R in the diamond logo of the superhero, but this has all the, the, the this looks like the Earth 2 Robin adult look. I love this outfit. This is great. I, I really, and this was, this was a really fun issue. I had so much fun reading this. I was buying this for a while. And then um, the art changed and um, <laughs> it's great. And um, yeah, that's um, that is Batman Superman twenty six. We had Catwoman sixty four, which is one that I'm enjoying. It's written by Teeny Howard, and it's got some really good art by um, uh, what's Carmen Carmine D. Gian Domenico and uh, it's Selena Kyle and she's in her her purple outfit and I'm loving it. <coughs> Sorry. I love the purple outfit. I'm so tired of the black latex of the fetish look this looks more iconic it looks superhero worldish you know i'm done with hyper reality in these superhero comics these are supposed to be imaginary places fictional places and um and the whole thing is selena's on a um On um, Selena has nine lives. At the end of Gotham War, there was some kind of Vandal Savage meteor thing that had Lazarus uh, pit abilities. So she died and was reborn, and she's got now she's got nine lives, and so she's doing these capers that you know originally she wouldn't have done because they would have been too dangerous. Now that she's got a one over, uh, you know, a one up. Or actually nine up, she's doing things she's never done before, and it's and it started off too, like you know, uh, like you know, with uh, Stefano Rafali's art, which like once again Italian, uh, you know, line art, you know, guy from Italy, it's the, the same school of thought that brought us Milo Manara, nice fine line work, appreciation for feminine form and classic beauty. Um, so I've been really into so. And Teeny Howard's been just been knocking it out of the park, at least for the past six issues. So here we go. Once again, creator that, you know, people on my side of the aisle malign. Well, here she is doing some yeoman's work. Um, Wade is a great writer, but needs to shut his pie hole and stop stirring up trouble. Both sides are both sides are a bunch of babies. Yeah, we could say that about every side. I mean, um, I disagree. Oh, sure. I mean, I just, um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the story is going at least nine, par nine, nine parts. That's, um, I don't know. I just, I I'm pleasantly surprised by it. And Dwayne Nail designed that Earth 2 cot. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Let's see. It was Jay Garrick, The Flash, number six of six by Jeremy Adams, which is really fun. Great artwork. And just in it, that was um, 
that that was a really good flash book. It really was. Uh, Green Lantern War Journal number eight. That was really good as well. And they've kept, he's kept his, um, that's Philip Kennedy Johnson doing a John Stewart book. And he's kept his line artist, Montas, uh, the whole time so far. So, and that's, I've been reading this book since it was the backup feature in Jeremy Adams' uh, Green Lantern 1, 2, and 3. So, and it just, it hasn't been my cup of tea, but I got a lot of respect for it. You know, I guess it's, um, it's decent. And I think it's tying back into like, like Dark Stars and that mythology somehow. Maybe they're going to bring Dark Stars back. That would be cool, huh? John Stewart was one of the Dark Stars along with Donna Troy. Um, Kat Matui? No, no, she died at Green Lantern. Yeah, okay, this is. Yeah, um, Superman number 13. Let's put a pin in that for a minute because it's time to play What's in the Bag. What did I buy from my local comic book shop this week? I go to my local comic book shop every Wednesday or mostly every Wednesday. Uh, now that I got a, um, I'm on a, um, a poll list. I don't have to, I don't have FOMO anymore, fear of missing out because I'm usually covered, and um, I spent almost fifty dollars this week. There were a couple of things there that caught my eye that um, I wanted to pick up. So uh, let's see what I did. I haven't sorted these yet either. Speaking of Superman thirteen. It's part two of House of Brainiac by Joshua Williamson and art by Sandra Rafa, uh, Rafa Sandoval. And um, this ended up being pretty fun. Really did. Um, big, you know, it's a Superman, it's a team up with Superman and the main man. Superman and the main man. Really good stuff with Lobo. Yeah, I, I just really enjoyed the heck out of this. I also got. See, I got the first issue of Superman. I got to check and see which ones I don't have. But I didn't have these two. I'll tell you that much. Issue three and issue four. I might have issue two. I'm not sure. I know I got issue one. Um, but I think I I need to go back and start filling in what I haven't picked up. I've been buying it. Like I came back about issue seven or, or eight, maybe, maybe six or seven. And so there are just a couple out there that I'm missing. So I'm filling in the blanks for this. And yeah, I got a, look at a nifty variant cover for $1 more. This might, yes, this uh, it, um, Superman 13 will connect with Action Comics. And it has the good old fashioned triangle number. I love that. So yeah, I end up getting three issues of this Superman series. By Joshua Williamson. This has been really good. This has surprised me. I'm buying Superman monthly. I used to be a Batman fan. I still am. I'll always be a Batman fan. But I'm a lot older now. And I've mellowed out. And I see a big value in Superman. And the aspirational. And in the moral. And in the the, the iconic. And in, in, in the... the, 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 the have be, being this valuable you know thing to 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 want to be just like what nietzsche said when he came to you know and thus sp uh, spoke spake zarathustra come down from the mountain i give to you the ubermensch the superman this this ideal of how to live huh maybe maybe but yeah superman by joshua williamson that's one of my favorite comic books, new comic books. You see someone out there saying, hey, there's nothing good out there. Don't give money to people that hate you. I agree with you. Don't give money to people that hate you. I don't buy Greg Pak. I don't buy Alyssa Wong. I don't buy Dan Slott. I don't buy, um, I, 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 you know, David Pipos. I don't buy Becky Cloonan. You know, I don't buy Donny Cates. You know, that light, light, I don't buy Tim Sheridan. I, you know, the list can only grow the more I figure, you know, more you realize who's got you blocked in social media. Um, 
So yeah, I know those people hate me. That's a hateful act to block you on Twitter through a group list. I mean, that's a hateful act. That's what I consider. So yeah. Then that says more about the person that uses a block list than it does about me and my adjacency and who I'm friends with. But yeah, I mean, just, I'm happy to be picking these up. Yeah, yeah, I could get the trade paper back. Sure. But I like floppies. I really do. And this one, this is um, coming out in digital. Justice League Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2. I'll have to check that out. I love Crises on Infinite Earths. But look at the Robin. And look, there's a Batman Beyond. Seriously. I mean, it's like... It's, a, it's, it's its own interpretation. Isn't it now? Isn't it? This has been pretty good. It's size Spurrier um, and Aaron Campbell's Black Label 499. This is John Constantine Hellblazer, Dead in America. This is really spooky. Yeah, John Constantine hanging out with an old friend. Swamp Thing. And I don't think this is Ram V's Swamp Thing. This is might still be Alec, Hall, uh, Alec Holland in a way. Because this is like a non-canonical John Constantine. I don't think this is the same Constantine that is that was in um, Spirit World by uh, Alyssa Wong during the We Are Legends. And um, there is a John Constantine of Prime Earth Zero. I don't think this is him. This Constantine is the closest that we'll ever get to having the original Vertigo John Constantine. This is this is pretty like tonally. It's it's there. You know, I lo really liking this. And there's previous stuff to this too that I have to catch up on. Talking about Crisis on Infinite Earths, I got the Facsimile, three ninety nine. I had Crisis when I was a kid. It's this beautiful wraparound cover. It's George Perez art. But one thing I noticed, and this is where I want—I need to ask Dwayne Muth. He might remember, because in one of the, my biggest draws for the facsimile editions are the advertisements. Okay, and this issue has no advertisements, and I am thinking like. Was this an ad-free comic book to begin with? I would love to get like a reader copy of Crisis Number One just to compare. And uh, but yeah, there are no ads in this. It's all story, but it was the first issue of a twelve-issue maxi series that was meant to like redefine the DC universe at its time in nineteen eighty-five for the fiftieth anniversary of what would become DC Comics National Periodical Publications More Fun number 1 was released in 1935 Action Comics in 1938 and that's why it's 85 is the 50th anniversary okay you see mm -hmm. da -dun -dun -dun. indeed but yeah there's a, there are no ads in this so i that i would like to check that out and see uh, what became of that moon man number 2 from image comics Written by Kyle Higgins and Scott Miss Cootie, who is also known as Kid Cootie, hip hop artist. Um, issue one was okay, pretty good. So I got issue two, and um, it's kind of boring, a lot of talking, and um, it just didn't go anywhere for me. Didn't do anything for me. There's just a just a lot of talking going on. Sometimes it happens, though. Okay, it's a, it's a story. It's an illustrated story too. I know, you just like you can't be action scenes, all of it, but just it just felt flat. It might have killed my momentum. So let's see if I actually get issue three or not next month. Don't know if I will. I got Hulk's giant size Hulk. I did, and uh, a lot of it had to do with the reprint with D Peter David and Dale Keown. Hulk 372. 
that came out, what, 1987, 1988? Bruce struggling with Betty. <laughs> and then Betty leaving the church because she loves Bruce. And then someone's after Bruce to try to get Hulk. It's just like, you know, great transformation scene. So we can see like this Dale Keown transformation bursting out of Hulk bursting out of, of Banner. It looks so, yeah. Good shit. I love Dale Keown art. Look at that. Oh, look at that Hulk face. So I'm already paying $4.99, $3.99 to $4.99 for a facsimile anyway. And this went for uh, $6.99. So I'm okay with that because I have been buying every issue of Hulk anyway. And uh, so this will just go in the collection with it. And this could be my pick of the week. Because it was pretty darn good and fun. Cobra Command of Four of Five, written by Joshua Williamson. He's been just knocking that out of the park these days. And it's just the tale of, you know, we're we're this is the the Energon universe and how the GI Joe team and the Cobra, you know, and, and Cobra end up either allies or enemies with Autobots and Decepticons. Yeah. Ah, exact. Okay. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you a lot. Exactly. Cool. Good to know. Yeah. Because I was just like, because I was like, I love the ads and these 80s reprints. Really do. Uh, Cobra Commander. This was just a fun book. It's it's over the top. It's wacky. Um, I mean, it's loud. <coughs> I don't know if those are just cut and paste on them on a pay. I think those could be drawn. It could be drawn with a stylus on a on a tablet, but still, it follows the you know organic line and and, and looks like part of the art. But ain't that some freaking? Ain't that a battle? This is a fight scene. Look at that. Look at those sequential panels. It's disjointed. It's confusing. It's just I just really really like this a lot. And Cobra Commander is a great voice, and it's a nice consistent voice too. Uh, same thing with Duke. Like, I got to read Duke number five early. And I'm like, I, I'm just so impressed with it that it's just Duke number five. You know, we'll talk about that later as, uh, on, on Wednesday but when it comes out. And we'll we'll talk about it next Sunday because we'll have a copy because that's on my poll list too. Uh, but these Energon Universe titles have been really fun. I'm so happy to be tuned into that. Yes, I, I, I'm with you, too. I mean, Crisis on Infinite Earths remains, like, story-wise and art-wise, just pound for pound, one of, the, one of the strongest books ever. I would just get lost in those pages, that George Perez art, for, for, for time after time and reread after reread for over the years. So what did I get? What, what kind of manga did I get? I was just like, I looked on the shelf. I wanted to get a, I wanted something new or old. And this is old. And I, it's actually used. So it was $10. All the rest of them are $15 uh, brand new. But I decided to take a, a chance. I got Berserk, Volume 1, by the late Kentaro Miura. And his unfinished, his unfinished huge story, Berserk. I guess that Berserk will get finished by his his protege, uh, you know, um, his assistant. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. But this thing starts off right from the beginning in the first page uh, with, with, with the sex scene. And the girl that Guts is on top of turns into a demon. And, um, and it's got this insanely good i would i want to show it but it's like i can't it's berserk i'm not going to show these pages um i haven't even finished it yet i don't know if i'm going to get the rest of them this is like but this is game of thrones level brutal this was written in this was done in 1989 
and um, continued publication straight up until his death recently, this last year or earlier this year. Um, and it's unfinished. Um, and it's had, I think, two different animated adaptations in that time as well. I've never been familiar with this. I've never touched it. Um, <laughs> and um, it's and it's up by Dark Horse Comics as well. And uh, let's see. Let's look at the Indicia. 1989, Kentaro Miura. All rights reserved. So this was this was printed in 2003. This talk upon itself when Dark Horse had the license. I wonder if Viz has it now. You know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like some. I do like dark shit. I mean, uh, but I I'm just gonna I'm gonna check it out. I'm also gonna check out a few other volumes. Number one, I'm gonna. I'm going to check out One Punch Man. I'm going to check out My Hero Academia. And I will eventually check out One Piece and Spy Spy Family. People can't shut up about Spy Family. And I'm, you know, I want to read more manga. I mean, I was one of these original 80s, 70s, 80s kids in that first, the, the first American manga appreciation generation. So, I mean... I'm also thinking about getting all six volumes of uh, of Akira. I think it's time. I've been tempted to buy Akira. I've been looking at Akira since I was in high school, you know. And it's it's amazing that that six volumes of Akira got adapted into a two hour movie. I like to joke around and say, "You want to enjoy Akira? Watch the movie," you know, because just it's it's a bit more brass tacks in the story. It's very stripped down. And, um, exactly. <laughs> and, um, thank you. Start small assassination classroom before berserk or one piece. Cool. Yeah. I still have to finish, um, um, crazy food truck. I have, uh, you know, volume three, but I wanted to re restart it so I can just, you know, enjoy the whole thing. So that's like on my mega list. And why not just borrow them from my library? See, that's a good, that's a great question. I have a library. I I don't have a library card. I know. And um, maybe I should. But yeah, I mean, Berserk, it's, um, I'm barely 20 pages into it. I do like it. Don't get me wrong. I've seen some of those brutal anime in the world in the late 80s and early 90s when a lot of that hentai shit slid under the radar because people didn't know and how bad that shit was too. I mean, I've seen the legends of the the first three legends of the Overfiends, those that the the unrated ones. I mean, those that's that shit's fucked up. You know, here I am. And speak of the Jack show again, you know, like they were used to be taught. They used to talk about redo a healer and they don't talk about that anymore because, you know, just that's that one is fucked up, too. But I mean, so I've seen some heavy shit when it comes to, you know, when it comes to anime and manga. So and I don't think anything will surprise me. This might. Because this gets really creative with its violence. And um, <laughs> One Punch is funny. I think you'd enjoy One Punch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear good things about that. Maybe Avatar, you know, but it's like there are just so many manga out there and so little time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and uh, and I have to make time to like you know read audiobooks too. Like I'm rereading um, Solaris by Stanislav Lu. Um, it's a it's a Soviet era sci-fi uh, book that became a, a movie by Andrei Tarkovsky. And then in 2000, 
uh, another remake of that movie by Steven Soderbergh. And um, it's such an interesting story. You know, if, if you're into sci-fi, may I suggest Solaris? Yeah, by Stanislaw Lowe. It's good stuff. Um, and that's about it for today. Thank you so very much for tuning into the live show. Wow, we went extra long today. Well, we had a lot of comic books to talk about. I read a lot of books this week. And um, and I'm glad that you're here for this conversation, this comic book shop style conversation. Thank you so much. It's time I'm going to make some supper. I'm having pork shredded. I'm having pulled pork tacos. It's true. I got some pulled pork from the grocery store and I throw it in with my rice. So I get the rice cooking, throw some veggies in there. And I throw the pork in there right from the fridge. So it's like, so as it's cooking, you know, you take the lid off the rice cooking, you just, you know, you know chunk it up a bit and, get, you know, mix it all together. And uh, then I heat up some tortillas and some cheese and some lettuce. And I just go to town on that. I have like six tacos. Just all for me, not sharing. Now I'm not sharing with you, Pika. No, well, maybe you can have a bite. <laughs> thank you so very much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your weekend too. And thank you for tuning in and having this great comic book shop style conversation. Remember, we share, we, we are the live chat. We share all of these feuding individuals. Maybe we're the ones that have to lay down the law with them and be like, you guys, we're pulling over the car. You're not going to get to Dis I was taking you to McDonald's and you're not getting McDonald's if you don't behave and start, you know, be nice to each other. Seriously. I think that, you know, just the other pe the people on the other side of the aisle, this is what they want division and us not getting along. Yes. Fax me a taco shell. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so very much. God bless. Namaste. Good luck. Please like and subscribe. Turn on those notifications. Ring that bell. And we will see you again on Wednesday, 4 p.m. U.S. Eastern with the comic book preview of new comic books on New Comic Book Day. Look for the gratitude lists in the morning. And hopefully I'll have more cooking videos available in the future. God bless. Namaste. Good luck. We will see you again in those. Funny pages. Ciao. Bye-bye.